Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of our video series talking about the seismic calculations via the ASC-7 and its application Autodesk Robot. In today's video, we are going to be talking about something called the vertical distribution and the horizontal distribution because those are the things that are needed to be done if you want to do a manual calculation of seismic loads on a structure. Now I know that I sometimes say seismic and sometimes I say seismic, it's because yeah, I speak German and in German they say I instead of E when there is an EI. So sometimes I might make a mistake. Anyway, in today's video we are going to shed light on the mathematical equations necessary to perform the calculation of the shear of the base shear for each floor as well as the shear of the base shear on each one of those load lateral load carrying systems. So with that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, so let's recap. What is the thing that we reached last time? The thing that we understand from last video is how to calculate something called the base shear. And if you are new to this video series, please check out the previous video for more context. So now, after our long calculation with a ton of coefficients to be determined, we know exactly what this force is. It is a percentage of the weight as we have explained before. Now, this base shear must be distributed on the stories in the structure. So how do I do that? This is called vertical distribution and is explained in equation 12.8-11 and 12.8-12. You see, it says basically that the force on a story, so Fx is F1, for example, F2, F3, and F4. The force on a story depends on a fraction or is a fraction of the total base shear. This Cvx is basically a coefficient that calculates what the fraction of base shear is that the story gets. And this equation looks intimidating, but it's actually really easy to understand. So first of all, the coefficient needed for calculating the share of the story from the base shear, like 10%, 20%, and so on, depends on the ratio of the story's weight and height divided by the total of all story weights and all story heights. But there is one trick here. The trick being that there is a k exponent, meaning that it could be a linear relationship, it could be a quadratic relationship, we don't know, and it depends on the period of vibration. Like the period of vibration, if it is less than half, and by the way, period of vibration is t, which equals to ta, something we explained in the previous video. If the period of vibration is half or less, then the exponent is 1, so you have a linear function. If the period is 2.5 or more, so it's a long vibration, then uh, the k is 2, and anything in between can be interpolated. Okay, now, how do I make sense of this function? Like, what is this even? To explain the sense of the function, well, it means, first of all, that higher stories and more massive stories take more share of the base shear. That's what it means. Look, if you have a story that is higher and or heavier it will take more share from the base shear because it's a ratio between the weight and the height power k divided by the total of all the weights and heights of every story but does it even make sense yeah i want to explain this by saying imagine that you have a stick this is stick a okay and you take the stick in your hand and basically swing it back and forth the amount of force you have to apply on the base of the stick is basically the amount of force necessary to move the stick now, this stick has no weight at the end of it. So what happens if I attach a weight to it at the end? Now, of course, me applying a force is going to be higher because the weight will actually need more force for me to move. So first of all, the amount of force I need to impart on one story depends on the weight of the story. The second thing that it depends on is the length of the stick. In this case, the story height. If I have the same weight on a stick that is shorter, then it becomes easier for me to move the stick. That's why the height of the story plays a role in this equation. That's why we have an L or H here. So you see, you see the length and weight of the stick, in other words, the story height, sorry, the story height and the story weight of the stick affect how much force it would need to be moved. So it affects the share that it takes from the base shear. Now, if you have multiple masses, then you must split those forces on all of the masses. So you need to calculate the share of each force. I hope that makes sense. Now, for the horizontal distribution, that's a harder story. Luckily for us, we don't need to do the horizontal distribution because softwares usually do that for us. If a software lacks the ability of calculating any seismic loads, 
like you have a software uh, that doesn't do any of that, then you can still use this software to perform a, an earthquake analysis. How you do so? By calculating the base shear, distributing it on each individual, individual story, and then you apply those forces in your software, and the software will calculate it up until here are the steps you need to do in order for you to be able to manually apply earthquakes in a software that lacks the earthquake abilities. For the horizontal distribution, every software can do a horizontal distribution because it's based on stiffness. So if you have a slab like this, for example, and you have some columns and shear walls on the slab and you apply a horizontal force, then the software itself, due to the finite element method, would be able to calculate the share of the force on each one of those elements. The horizontal distribution seems to be a superfluous topic, but I will discuss it anyway because I want it. I want this series to be complete. How do I even do that? If you have the shear on a story, then you can find the share of the shear on each one of those elements. So basically, if we have the load on the story, we need to distribute it in all the lateral resisting elements. And there are some notes I need to explain here. Note number one, the story shear is applied in the center of gravity. Why? Because this is a dynamic thing. An earthquake is the dynamic movement of a ground. And if you have dynamics, then the dynamics are applied at the center of gravity of an element. And that's why the story shear is applied at the CG of a story. Now, there is a big issue here. If the center of gravity does not coincide with the center of rigidity, an inherent torsion is going to be produced. Furthermore, a 5% accidental torsion is to be applied. Now, usually, we do this via softwares. I don't want to explain. Look, now here there is like the amplification of torsional moment and so on. You should read it. And I kept it here because I want to reference this to you because I want my video series to be as complete as possible. So you should check this out and exactly understand what it means. I think this is also part of torsional irregularity. But I want to talk here. You have a center of gravity of the story. The center of gravity of the story is usually taken as the center of gravity of the slab. Now this is an approximation, ladies and gentlemen, because a story is not only consisted of slabs, it's also consisted of columns and beams and so on. But still, if you want a good approximation, you could use the center of gravity of the slab as being the center of gravity of your story. The center of rigidity, which is here, this center of rigidity is the center of the load resisting elements. Now how do you calculate that? It's not written in the slides, by the way, but it's the centroid of inertia. It's important to understand that the center of rigidity may or may not coincide with the center of gravity. Now, the center of rigidity is what I like to call the center of resistance. So this is the point around which the structure is actually going to rotate. This is its pivot point because that is the point of the center of the resistance. Now, the force is applied at a point not at the pivot point. If you apply the force on the center of rigidity, then no twisting will occur. But due to, due to Newton's second law, F equals M times A, the force due to dynamic effect is always applied at the center of gravity. So there might be an eccentricity between the center of gravity and the center of rigidity. This eccentricity will cause the structure to twist around the center of gravity, causing torsion. Now, this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. However, the softwares usually do this for you. The only thing you have to do in a software is to apply the force at the center of gravity, and the finite element method will do the rest. But before I continue, I want to mention again and reiterate that the center of rigidity may or may not coincide with the center of gravity. It coincides with the center of gravity if the load-carrying elements are doubly symmetric, meaning the inertias are symmetric around the centroid. But in this case, it obviously isn't. The second thing I want to mention is the provision of accidental torsion. You can see that there is a provision of applying a 5% accidental torsion. Now, how, how or why even? Well, the reason why is actually simple, and the how is what I want to explain. The how is, well, you see the dimension of the structure. Let's say this is, I don't know, 20 meters, and let's say this is 15 meters. So besides the inherent eccentricity, which is here because this is center of gravity and then center of rigidity, you should move the center of rigidity 5% in each direction. So you have 20 here and you have 15 here. So what is 5% of 20? 5% of 20 is 1 meter. So you have 1 meter in the x direction, positive, negative. And 
5% of 15 is, uh, let's see, 10% is 1.5, 0.75. So you would have an, ex an accidental eccentricity of 0.75 in this direction. So how would you apply that? You would apply that by making different cases. And I will show you this in Otto's robot when the time comes. You would have to move the center of rigidity one time eccentricity x, one time eccentricity y, uh, one time eccentricity x positive, one time eccentricity x negative. One time eccentricity y positive, one time eccentricity y negative, and I did not see it. I did not see even robot. I did not see robot do a combined eccentricity where you move this location, this location, this location, and this location. Now I am a fan of moving in all cardinal directions: north, south, east, west. The robot does that, so that is what accidental eccentricity means. Now, of course, moving the center of rigidity can be done by hand. But it's the same as moving the center of gravity. So in the end, you can also apply the accidental eccentricity by moving the center of gravity instead of the center of rigidity. Because if you want to do a manual calculation, you know where the center of gravity is, but the center of rigidity might be complicated. So you could account for the torsion by, as an alternative, taking the center of gravity and moving it. Which means that the force application point is going to move in space a little bit positive and negative here, positive and negative here. So you're going to apply the force one time dead in the center, one time eccentricity, 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 eccentricity. Those are different cases. But the question is still, why do I apply an accidental eccentricity? Now, the first idea that would come into mind is, well, because those rigidities, the inertias, might be wrong. And that's one reason. However, another very important reason is, how do you know where the center of gravity is? I said previously that it's basically the center of gravity of the slab. But is that so? Well, it isn't, because of gajillion reasons. Reason number one out of gajillion is that you have columns that you're not accounting for in the center of gravity. Reason number two is that besides the self-weight, there is dead load. And yes, you are con you're considering a superimposed dead load of something kilonewton meter square. But who told you that? You might in reality have a higher dead load here and a lower dead load here and a higher dead load here. So the center of gravity is actually moving. Not only this, in some cases, you would have to include parts of your live load. Now, who knows where that one is? So you see, the idea of center of gravity seems nice and dandy on paper, but there are practical considerations. And the code does simplify that by telling you, hey, apply a 5% accidental eccentricity. So even if you have a center of rigidity exactly the same as center of gravity, you still have to move the force a little bit and you would have to have an accidental torsion. Now, I hope that's clear. In the end, the force on each element is going to be uh, due to two forces. So for example, the force on this shear wall is going to be an addition. And by the way, I say shear wall here, but it also works for a frame. The force on this shear wall is coming from two sources, the direct source and the indirect source. The direct source is basically due to the shear force itself, V, on the story, and the indirect uh, source is because due to the torsion, T. I will save you the details. Um, the force on each element is distributed based on its inertia, so stiffer elements will get more force in the X and in the Y, and the same thing applies for the torsion. For the torsion, you have to add the inertias. It is a pseudo polar moment of inertia calculation. It's the inertia x, x square and inertia y, y square. And of course, here you have the inertia y, y. Similarly here. You should pause the video, print screen this equation and figure out why it looks like this. Check out your mechanics and materials part. You will understand that this makes perfect sense. This is the amount of force that a shear wall feels due to torsion. And the torsion is the force multiplied by the eccentricity. Now, this is cool and it's a nightmare to hand calculate. Luckily for us, we don't need to hand calculate because our efforts end at the time we get the force on the stories. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today about horizontal and vertical displacements. I hope you enjoyed. And with that being said, I want to give a vertical distribution sized shout out to media channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos hopefully on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve and for that I am forever thankful. In the end, I hope that you enjoyed the video and you found it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting and so on, especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.